Hey guys, it's Jan and Alex again from Top Guns here in Terre Haute. And Jan, we have a awesome, awesome gun in front of us. And um, this is one that you want to go into a little bit more detail and history on. And so let's talk history about the Maxim gun. This is the very first machine gun invented. True machine gun was a Maxim gun. Uh, they come out in, believe it or not, 1889. 1889. Can you hear us all right on there? Just because I know that we're a little busy in here and the phones are ringing, but 1889 would be the first year for the Maxim machine gun. Could you imagine machining that, getting everything together at that time period? Well, now, we'll talk a little bit about the inventor. Maxim is not particularly well known and uh, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. Maxim was a great inventor. Uh, one of his inventions was a gas light. Uh, when all the cities were lit with gas lights, uh, he invented the actual light and things he invented in and still used today. He invented a gas regulator, like on propane or natural gas or even your LP grill. That's a maximum invention. Really? Also. I didn't know that. So and, walking down the street, one of those you know poles that would have had a gas light on a, it, that Maxim was, also made that. He invented, he invented and, that. And we were talking before, again, you were telling me all the cool stuff that he invented. What are some other things that, that he doesn't necessarily get credit for, but people wouldn't expect? Well, he invented the first electric light. Uh, they say Al, uh, Edison invented the light bulb. Well, that was an incandescent light. The first electric light was a arc light, and that was also a Maxim invention. And uh, he was an early pioneer in coarse gas and electricity, too. So um, we have a lot of firearms enthusiasts on our channel, all right? <laughs> yeah. And and we'll get right back to all the, all the good inventions that he came up with. Well, that was but, most, mostly okay. it, but he so, tell he come up with these. So now he gets into the market and he wants to, to manufacture firearms. Well, the story goes, and it's a rather interesting story. Now, Maxim told the story in his memoirs and he was known to embellish, but the story goes he was exhibiting his gas and electric lights in the Paris Exposition in the early 1880s. And an American come up to him and says, Hiram, hang your gas and your electricity. You want to make a pile of money and invent something to let these Europeans slit each other so with quicker dispatch. <laughs> where, where was Maxim from? He was actually from Maine. He was a U.S. citizen. Okay. He was from Maine. And uh, after the exposition, he went to move to England, hired a couple of machinists, and he started from scratch. And it was just because he was an inventor. He, he was wasn't in necessarily a guy that was like, I'm a firearms enthusiast and I want to make guns. No, he, he was an inventor. Right. And uh, nobody had done it. Uh, the most complicated firearm at the time, there were no semi-automatic anything, not to mention machine guns. Uh, the Gatling gun, of course, that's a manually operated gun. That sure. came out before it. Uh, and, and tell some people if, if they're new to it, a Gatling gun would be manually operated with some sort of it had crank. a crank on the side and you would crank it and it would manually load. And so it's not, you're not just pulling, pulling the trigger, the trigger. you're yeah, cranking it around to be able to fire it. So <laughs> right. Maxim thought, we'll do I something. guess Maxim and some others at the time probably. Uh, actually he was the only one. Uh, the next uh, inventor of the machine gun would have been John Brown. Okay, so but, Maxim would have been number one. He would have thought, how can I use this type of material, this 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 type of platform, be able to shoot multiple times, multiple times uh, quickly. Uh, there's a lot of first in these guns. Uh, when he first developed a gun, the first magazines he used stick magazines, gravity fed out of the Gatling guns. They weren't reliable. Okay. And then he invented a drum magazine, rotary drum magazine. It didn't hold enough so, ammunition. So am I hearing you right? Like. A, a Gatling gun back in the day, Maxim actually had came up with the stick part of that? No, that come from the Gatling guns. He used oh, okay. it to feed He used these. it in the Gatling gun and he thought yeah, that would work in this. But it, it wasn't reliable. For, it was gravity fed and wasn't reliable. Gotcha. Then he been, invented a rotary drum magazine and it didn't hold enough rounds. And they went on with modifications to be the drum magazine on the Lewis gun and the Russian DP series. Uh, a Lewis gun. Tell me a little bit about what what does that? What how would people recognize that? Uh, would that well, be they, something that would be kind of obscure, or would that be something they that people would have uh, seen? The British used a lot of. Uh, Lewis was an American too, but the Brit, uh, the U.S. ordinance wouldn't adopt them. Him and the head of ordinance didn't like each other. Gotcha. And so just so everybody watching, I, I know that we kind of get off topic sometimes, but we will, I promise you, cover as much about the Maxim machine gun here as possible. But, but anyway, it's, it's good to have a little bit of knowledge about other things to get us to why this would have been in front of us. Well, then he invented the first machine gun belt. Uh, this is what the first machine gun belt would have looked like. 
uh, is basically two heavy strips of canvas. If you look here, here, I don't know if that fit through there. It should. And so kind of didn't want any live rounds in here. We've got to be safe. But anyway, it, uh, there's brass spacers in there that hold the two canvas strips together to form the pocket for the cartridges. And this is what the first machine gun belt would have looked like. It had all the brass. Now, the original belts would have been about 10 foot long. They held 250 rounds. Holy cow. So, why would he have thought, I need a belt? What, what do you think would have went through his head to think, I need a belt to be able to, to run this thing as fast as possible? I at that time, obviously, he was using the material that he I'd had. had at hand, yeah. yeah. They didn't have the technology to make right. the disintegrating links at the time. And like I say, it would be actually relatively cheap to make. To, yeah. And like I say, you can make them any length you want. And yeah, I'm uh, sure he probably made the, uh, the machine that it went in, you know? Uh, more than likely. Um, he also on this gun, I'll kind of open it up a little bit. Um, this is the belt feeding mechanism here. It's hard to see. Uh, it's a shuttle um, with feed paws and uh, the feed paw and the blocking paws. So let's go over. What, tell me my can't, can't, what can't. is my entrance side and what's my exit side? The belt would actually go in this side like this. So entrance side. And then the belt would come out this way. And the cartridge would come out. There's a little hole. You can't see it. It's in the front here. And it ejects the cartridge. So the Basil, go ahead and see if we can, can get in. front. You'd have to oh, look. right here. He said you can get Clint. in through the front. You might look in that way. Okay. Yeah. What I have? They're down here. That's where it ejects the uh, empty cases. So if you guys can see, it's very hard to see, but it would be right in there. Right in here. That's where the empties Which is kind of neat. That's where the empties come out. But this system here with the holding paws and the feed paws and the shuttle is used in almost every modern machine gun today. A variant now you you of call them paws. They're little levers. Um, they're hard to see. You can see them in, you see where my finger yeah. is. You, yeah. you can see the one back here. There's. And, and what does a paw do? Well, when the belt and the cartridge goes in, one keeps it from going all that, holds it in line. And then the other one, oh, this will move back and forth. You can see this lever here will move back and forth. And, and that, that will keep feeding it It will keep moving and it so over. so it's going to actually grab probably the brass portion. Uh, actually, it, it pushes on the cartridge. Okay. It pushes right. on the cartridge because the cartridge would gotcha. make a make And a so that, the brass, I guess, is just there to be, yeah. be sturdy and hold, hold the separation. Yeah. Right. So before we got on, again, um, we, we talk a little bit about these things before we get started because, you know, he's a wealth of knowledge and I know absolutely nothing. So um, when we look at this, what is the actual model that we're looking at right now? Okay, this is a German Maxim. Uh, it's this, a German. This is German. This would have been the German heavy machine gun of World War One. It's called an MG-08. An MG-08. So uh, here, here's my question. You said it's a German. And, but you said that Maxim was a U.S. citizen. Well, Maxim in the uh, 1890s, uh, he sold Maxim guns to anybody who had the money and whoever wanted them. Good for him. And uh, uh, there was a lot of people used them. Uh, the Germans, uh, what they do is you'd buy so many, uh, Vickers actually built the guns for Maxim. British. So would, I, I guess my question would be, uh, if, if Maxim made the design, he took and, more oil, uh, <laughs> Okay. Exactly. All right. So, so you said Vickers, correct? Vickers. Is that a U.S.? No, that's a British company. A British. <laughs> All right. So that's, we have Maxim. We have Vickers, which is a British company, manufacturing Vickers. this for him. Well, they, yeah, they made them for him, and uh, Vickers sent Maxim all over the world. Uh, the Germans signed a contract. What they would do is, is no country wanted to be dependent on anybody else for their arms, so they would uh, sell them the technical package and the tooling to build the guns and they would build their own then they would pay so much royalties and that way they made their own. Now the German firm at DWM uh, made a deal with uh, Vickers in 1899 to build this particular gun for the Navy, for the German Navy. German Navy, okay. For the German Navy for close independence. The German army didn't adopt it. How do you get it all straight? Because if you have an, an American citizen getting a design for a British manufacturer that sends The money in, went to Britain. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that it's, it's designing it and making it, I guess, would be the key. They send him a royalty check, but then they send it over, the tooling over to Germany, and they, and they, and they stamp them in Germany, well, they made them and, in Germany and make them in Germany off of a U.S. 
I, would it be a patent? They would have been British patents. A Brit British, British patent. and U.S. patents. Okay. Actually, he patented them everywhere. So and he was way. very, 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 uh, <laughs> let's say, he defended his patents really good. Good for uh, him. So when would have this have been used? Uh, Maxim guns were used. The first used one was actually in 1889. Uh, the Germans used these clear up in World War II. Really? Uh, and, you know, you don't think of this, you know, you think the modern ones, but uh, like on the uh, Normandy beaches, anywhere they was a fortified bunker, and they had some of these, they went ahead and used these. These guns are very, very reliable. Oh, I bet. So, I guess, let's take a step back. A lot of people don't even know what we're looking at. So what, what is this? This is a, this this is is a, a machine gun that is water-cooled, is that correct? Right, it's water-cooled. So, let's start from there. Let's talk, right. let's talk a little bit about the water-cooled water -cooled. process. Okay, if you see this hose here, this is called a condensing hose. Uh, you put water in here. This would be your drain valve here to drain the water out. So right under here, Basil, if you can that's see a that, valve. that, that is, is a drain valve. Yeah, I'm soily too. Oh, oil. Heat oil. <laughs> so what, what is he thinking? Mm -hmm. So it's a drain valve right under here, and you'll be able to empty it out. So what is this? This is just running steam? That's be steam. You get them hot enough and steam in there, and that's what they call condensing room. And they'd be what they call a water chest. It'd be a water can. You stick the end of that, and the steam goes into the water, condenses back into water, and you pour it back into gun. So water was hard to come by in a battlefield. That's what field. I figured. And if they didn't have water, they peed in them. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And the British were known in their water cooler gun to boil water for tea and Americans' coffee in there too. They get hot enough to do that. So uh -huh. we, we would we would go out and if we were getting ready to use this, we would take this out. We'd take this plug out, we'd plug fill it out full water. Fill this full water. Yeah. All right. We would shoot it. After that's getting done, it would compress into a vapor through it here. It takes about a thousand rounds to boil the water in the water jack. Would you fill it all the way up? Yeah, you would. You filled all the way. One hundred percent, all the way full. All the way full. Now, okay. in the top of it, it's interesting. There's, uh, there's a plug here in the top. Yep, right here in the very front is what he's talking. There's about. a tube within a tube, and there's a smaller diameter tube that's inside, and there's a port in this front cover that goes to this condensing hole. Then there's another tube that goes over the outside. The inner tube. So this isn't just a empty no, cylinder. No, it's not. A, the barrel's in there. I mean, too. obviously the barrel, but it's not just an empty cylinder. But the tube in the top. It has a slot in the back and a slot in the front. And the outer tube, when you raise a gun up, the tube slides, blocks the hole in the back so the water doesn't all run out. If you drop the muzzle down, it makes sure it doesn't. It hold. goes forward and blocks the. And all water-cooled machine guns use that, whether it's a U.S. 1917 or a Vickers or a Russian Maxim, whoever. They all use that very same system in the tube. And I know for a fact that that condensing hose there. Is not a German hose that fits the U.S. 1917 Browning machine gun. The fittings are the same. No, I figured he was <laughs> going to tell me it came off a John Deere tractor. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so we're, we're sitting this. Uh, let's go a little bit further out. We're sitting this on a mount. Yeah, Maxim machine guns were used by a lot of different people. The guns parts would not interchange. The Russians made more Maxims than anybody and used them longer than anybody actually. Because the Russians used it, uh, they was Maxim used clear up in the Korean War. And again, Russia would have made They that. made their own. Theirs was a 1910 version. Do you think they really paid them? For Not the after country? the communists took over. I kind of figured. <laughs> I, I, in, in my head, I'm sitting here going, well, if they already had the tooling for it, then why the hell do they need to pay them again? They, they would. They, they didn't. And yeah, then when right. the patents run out, they didn't pay them anyway. Okay, all right. The patents run out. So we're, we're sitting this on a mount, and on this mount, there's some really cool stampings. It, it says something like, That's along certain. lines 8531. They're all serialized, each part. There's a lot of cool stuff on it. Can you tell us a little bit about the mount before we start actually talking about the fun part, which is the firing mechanism? Okay, this is what they call a sled mount. And if you look, these runners here look like a sled. And there's uh, these two rings here. You would fold this leg up, and that will actually clear the flash suppressor. Okay. So that would go down. It'd go up. Oh, this goes over. It goes okay. over. Okay. It goes over. Oh. And you would tie a rope on it, and you could drag it across the battlefield like a sled. Or, if you look, there's four handles. You would have to, oh, okay. So that's, well. There's a handle here, one on each side. There's two on the front. And four right. guys could carry it like a stretcher. Because it's extremely heavy. Yeah, is this the handle? Is that what you're saying? Or is this the this is the mount that uh, loosens this up, correct? Uh, actually, this is what 
moves the legs. Yeah. So, so you if, if you guys can see this right here, I know this is going to be hard. It's in these. You can you can clamp this together, and this that would goes move in these notches. Right. It would move these out. I don't know if you guys can see that. Move these out into different notches for different levels. Now we will get to how they raise and lower it here in just a little bit. That's not how you do it. No. All right. <laughs> That's where you would set your height in your bunker. Let's right. say you had a. You had to come out through a, a cord or something. You would set the tripod up and down, and you wanted to be as low as you possibly could. So, how does the gun stay in the mount? Uh, it hooks on a trunnion right here and here on the front and on the back. There's another one that hooks on the back. So, right here, guys. So this comes. comes Tightening this comes over. The there is actually a piece of the gun which you can see right there. Yeah, what you call the trunnion. That's what they call the trunnion. Right here. And there's a top of it because it's blue. You can oh, see okay, yeah, yeah, right here. And there's one that sticks to the bottom. So so there's a obvious place for it. You know? Yeah, and there's that takes just, up the You're not just sitting this in between two clamps. No, that it hooks in there. And we'll get over here, we loosen this lever, and this is your traverse. You're back and forth sideways. Oh, and, okay. and of course, you can lock it in. And your elevation, you loosen this lever, and you got this hand wheel. And you can move it up. It's like like in, on a spigot. So if in like in World War, World War One, they were taught to aim at the ankles. Aim at the ankles. Because if a guy was crawling, you would get him, and if he hit him in the ankle, he'd fall. Fall in this. A little intense. But it makes sense. But anyway, uh, that's you know that's how they done it. And you, you would set the elevation, and then you would release the traverse, and you just walk it back. And right. Forward. So to me, it would almost seem like. I guess they would be crawling at that time, but I, when you said aim at the ankles, to me I'm thinking, man, I'm wasting a lot of rounds under the ground. They don't but worry about that. They, they don't, don't worry, worry about, about that. that. They all they're work. doing, this gun's made just to, to, to shoot. Let it all roll until you get more ammo. Right? I mean, and that's crazy. Oh, yeah. So well, uh, These guns, like I say, in World War One, it was nothing uncommon to shoot 20, 30,000 rounds through one of these in a day. Say that one more time. It was How many? 20 to 30,000 rounds in a day. That was day. nothing uncommon. So yeah. w we talked about this on an earlier video about switching barrels out. Would you switch barrels out? Uh, they would switch barrels about every 20,000 rounds, but uh, that's not an easy process. So days. then it wouldn't have been done? Uh, no. Now you wouldn't melt, as long as you had water in the gun, you wouldn't melt down a barrel. They would not melt down or burn up a barrel as long as you had water in the gun. Now the rifling would wear out and the accuracy would, mm -hmm. would uh, you know, deteriorate considerably. But it said the actress rate wasn't bad clear up to about 20,000 rounds. That's absolutely insane to me. Because well, they're cool. If you look, I know, but exactly, and that's why they're cool. You know, that's but why they're if you look at a lot of modern machine guns, some rentals that we've had, we're talking about half that, and this, these things are, are toasted, you know, in a lot of cases, which, which it blows my mind on this sometimes. So let's talk a little bit about what this is, how it fires. We haven't even talked about ammo it takes yet. Okay, uh, Maxim guns were in all kinds of calibers. So Obviously, because they were by you know, everybody. Yeah. The British guns were in 303. Uh, the German guns were in 762 by 57, the German service round. The Russian guns were in 762 54R, the Russian service caliber at the time. Uh, even the U.S. Army, they bought about 200 Maxim guns in all oh, about 1902, 1903, and. They were in a cartridge when they first came out. Nobody knows about it. It's the 3003. He said that, and I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, say it again, because I honestly thought he screwed up and said 30, didn't, meant to say 30 out of 6. But you said 3003. The first 03 Springfields were in 3003, and it was a uh, 200 grain bullet. It was a longer bullet, muzzle velocity was about 2,300 feet per second. And they found a German round, it was called a Spitzer, which would have been a pointed boat tail bullet, which had a lot better aerodynamics, and they rebarreled 03s to 30-06 in 1903. But the U.S. Maxims were in 3003, and then they switched to 30 6 I've never, it, all the way till today, I've never heard of a 3003 cap. Uh, they're, well, they're, you know, they did only eight or three years. So. Three years, so that would be something that, if you found some, it would be a rare, If you rare, found, if rare you found a, uh, a 1903 Springfield and 3003, I mean, you're probably setting up a fortune. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about, now that we know what caliber is this one. This is uh, 
7.92 by 57, the German server, everybody calls it 8 millimeter mouse. That's why I was waiting on actually, yeah. because I'm not this small. 8, eight millimeter mouser, which everybody has heard of that at least. So how would you load it? How would you, we've already okay. talked about it. We'd speed it through here. Okay. Now, what would you do after that and how would you fire it? Well, um, kind of the, you know, you've heard about going off half column to load this gun. You know, kind of a basil. Camera guy Basil, he comes in half cocked all the time. <laughs> You would put this in, could have cartridges, and you would pull it up until it hit the uh, holding paw. This is your cocking handle. You would hold this forward like this. You would pull it over to advance the belt. And now you're half loaded and half cocked. If you pull the trigger, it won't do anything because you just got a cartridge in the mechanism. So you push it forward again, pull the belt again, and then drop it. And then why, would you pull the, why would you do that? Because the first time just puts it in the feed mechanism. Which are, now, just, show everybody what that means in the feed mechanism portion. Okay. If you can. The first one, if you look in here, it would bring the, when you do it the first time, it brings the cartridge to here. So and, go ahead and point with that. Maybe they, they can see now, it. Right in here, you see these grooves? Okay, when you drop the, this would be the bolt. They call it the lock. If you look, this moves up. That picks up the cartridge by the rim. That's the first time. When you pull it back again, you have to advance the belt manually. The uh, belt advance does not work off the uh, lock or the bolt. It works off the uh, recoil mechanism. So you've got one sticking in the front of this. It drops down, lines up with the chamber, sticks it in the chamber, and advances and picks the next one. So there's actually two rounds in the face mm. of this. One in the chamber, and then one in the feed mechanism. Now when you unload them, you have to actually cock it twice to get both rounds out of it. If you just cock it once, it'll have one round in the chamber, even though they won't be one in the belt and mm -hmm. it will fill fire. So you have to cock them twice. So, all right, I loaded my mag, or excuse me, I loaded my belt. Um, I bring which way, which one forward? This one, this is your cocking. So now I cocked it in. I put one in the chamber. One in the chamber. You're What's my second step? Well, your cover would be closed. Okay, so your cover is closed. Your cover was it. always closed on these. No reason to ever have your cover up. Unless, unless you were cleaning it. it. Or repairing it. Right. And uh, they actually have a safety. This is the, the trigger. And uh, they call this a butterfly. And if you see, I can't push it forward. This would fire it. So you have to take your thumb and push this little lever over so it'll go forward. And I just fired it. <laughs> hmm. But it has a safety so you don't inadvertently... So, oh, so the safety is this little, little, little bit of lever right here. This you, have little lever. It, you have to hold it over while you push forward on the butterfly. Push, and then I'd push forward? Yeah, you just push forward. And you would use both hands. You'd use this one to disengage. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I got then, you. I got you. Interesting. So, if and, you look. Oh, yeah, while well, I'm here, yeah. you're back here. This side is your oil bottle. And yeah. this side is your cleaning solvent. <laughs> That's awesome. So look at this now, guys. If you're looking here on the top, this is your standard sight. What, tell us about this sight, and then maybe if I wanted to shoot something a little yeah. farther away, what would I have used? Well, this sight actually is folded down now, so it didn't get in the way. But, if, right. but if you look, it goes to, I think, about 2,000 meters. Okay. Of course, you know your elevation and everything like that. So that's your rear sight. Of course, your front sight is there. So you have it, Basil. If you want to look at this, this is a standard front sight, like you would see on anything else. Yeah. You know, this isn't anything fancy. It's just a standard front sight. So if I wanted to look at something, um, Jan, that would have been a little farther away, or in an other application, what would I have used? They had an optical sight. Even at the turn of the century, they had an optical sight for these, and the optical sight. Slides right in on there, and you was wondering what that was for, and that slides in just like that. And then you have an optical sight. So now, when you say optical sight, it's three power. Three power. So we're not talking no, it's distance not. over the field somewhere. We're talking not three power is not very powerful. Exactly. Scope, so, so what would? Why would I have used that over? My actually, they were sight? not actually used. They were used for what they call indirect fire. So if you you would set your angle, there's a go back on this. If you look on here, you would set this sight, this knob would turn, and you would set your sight, and you'd be shooting over the head of your own troops to put down some Oh, muscle. okay. They Got call it. that indirect fire. It's what they were used for mostly. Um, Why we're talking about the gun, too, unlike most firearms, your recoil spring 
hmm. is not under compression, it's under tension. And your recoil spring. So tell people what that, that would mean. The difference okay, is. like you take a, an M1 Grand or an AR when the gun fires, the bolt comes back, it compresses your recoil spring. Correct. So it, it bounces back. And it pushes forward. This would be like a screen door spring. When you okay, fired, it, it pulls the spring out. And then it? So it goes back. And that spring is adjustable. And if you look here, this is a actually a guide to tell you how much tension you have on your recoil spring. Why would you, why would you ever need to? I remember the turn of the century, and also these guns are in different calibers. And different calibers have different recoils. These guns are recoil operated. They have different recoil impulse, so you can adjust the gun to fit the ammunition. That's neat. So I guess, tell me why I would have different ammo. If it was chambered for... You know, different this. lots, different people, or cold. Okay. If okay. the weather gets cold and okay. the gun uh, gets sluggish, um, you would you, on the fly. You could at least change your. You cycle could change. Rate. Yeah, you could change. Uh, doesn't really change the cycling rate too much. It makes them more reliable. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, let's get to the facts here. A lot of people like to know what is this type of firearm worth and what is the cycle rate, or how hard is it to find? Which I'm assuming is hard. Actually, not as bad as you really? think. I, I figured this would be one the of mount is, the mount is extremely hard to find, especially because the Germans found out is this Is this mount. a German mount? This is a German mount. <laughs> How would you have found, you know, if, if somebody would have came across this, you know, and, and thought to themselves, I'm going to have a German mount in the, mount in the United States, man, that's, that's crazy. You know, how would, how would have the, the person that was even find one? Well, the interesting thing about these guns is most of these guns were given away by the U.S. government. In World War II, uh, I know for a fact this particular gun come out of the American Legion post. And during World War II, well, let's all go back up a little bit. <laughs> After World War I, uh, the Germans had to give the U.S. government reparations, and they got 15,000 German machine guns. They got 5,000 MG08s and 10,000 08-15s. And we may talk about that if I can find one in a week or so. Okay. But yeah, anyway, see, I mean, you know enough people out there. I'm sure we can track them down. I think we might. Anyway. This is an 08. Well, if you sold a certain number of war bonds, they would give you one of these. The VFW. Or American Legion. They would oh, American be, Legion. American okay. Legion Post. So American Legion Post would have said, I got to sell X amount of war bonds and I can or get Or if you, let's say German. you've done a lot of work for the government selling war bonds or anything else, they'd give you one. Now they were supposed to be what they call DWATs. And a DWAT's called, is a, what DWAT means is deactivated war right. trophy. So and it's like a scholastic split. fundraiser. Exactly, but you get a machine gun. Yeah, I give you a machine gun for a fundraiser <laughs> for to sell war bonds or whatever. Uh, they were supposed to weld the barrel shut, weld the, the lock to the trunnion, and most of them were. And some of them they didn't do anything to, they didn't care. Uh, in about 1944, they didn't give them all away. What was left over, they, they took out on a ship and throwed them in the ocean during about 1943, 44. But anyway, most of these guns, uh, like I could say, uh, actually come from the U.S. government and at the uh, German. Yeah, they're guns German, came but they, from the U.S. government. government. Yeah, because they're war reparations from <laughs> from selling war bonds to the the Legion that was on an American and British patent sent to Germany. Okay, got it. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, you know, there's business and there's war. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah wonder why I get confused, Basil. You wonder why I get confused. Yeah, it, right. is confused. <laughs> it is confusing. It is confusing. All right. So, the, what, the mount is actually hard to find because uh, early right, in let's the talk w about that. Well, how, would, how would you find a mount? How, what would a price of, of a mount be on the open market if I went just on a mount, probably, gun broker? Uh, if you can find a mount, most of these mounts uh, generally bring about $3,000. $3,000. Just, just for the mount, the gun, 20 20 so all together you could probably have easily 25 grand in one of these well there's all kinds of accessories that go with them too there's a big metal shield i saw that on a picture that yeah. there's a gentleman earlier showed show me a picture it goes around here is kind of a cover well that's actually a russian maxim um the russian maxim had a little wheel tripod had a little wheel pulled around like an artillery piece and they had a scattered shield now the germans had a steel shield that went around the uh, water jacket if you poke hole in the water jacket you can't shoot it all the water leaks out so oh, they had that. a heavy shield and they had another shield on their face. So this would have been kind of shrouded to protect They could be, but like most soldiers everywhere, that weighs a lot. I was going to say, they said, no, thank you. The hell. I don't I want to carry man, that. I never would have, I actually didn't think about that until right now is, man, if you put a, a hole in this, which would have happened for damn sure, yeah. you're done for a minute. 
until well, they, had patching, they had patching kits. <laughs> they had, they How had would kits. you patch it? They had like a hose clamp with a rubber thing, and you <laughs> put the hose clamp and the rubber over the hole and tightened it up. <laughs> Wonder, I wonder how they ever made it, you know, like, but when you're in that situation, you got to do what you got to do. Well, the other thing is, too, now you think about this, these guns come out in 1889, and Maxim was brilliant. Uh, it's water cool. What do you do in the winter? It, you know, and Maxim allowed for you, that. You heat that up. That's what I'm going to tell you. Well, if the barrel's froze in here, the barrel has to move back for it to function automatically. Now, you Say can function. Again? The barrel moves? Oh yeah, the barrel moves. Oh, oh, what was this that. little tidbit of knowledge back when we were talking up front? I didn't know that. You're <laughs> yeah. telling me this moves inside? Yeah, the barrel actually moves in the water jacket. Yeah. I'll explain how it works if you want to know. If you could just tell me why the barrel moves, that'd be great. It's recoil operated, so the recoil makes the barrel move back. Oh, which which was moving this actual lock that you called it? moves it. everything back. This Open it back up. I had no clue, Basil. I just want you to know there's no clue. If you look here, if I can get it to do it, because it's really hard. If you look, you can see, see how that all moves? All right, go ahead. See how this moves back and forth? Yeah, there's the two rails. Moves. The rails in there actually move too. And the way this works is it's a big toggle. And they say Maxim got the idea from the anatomy. The face of the uh, lock would be like the sole of your shoe. The first pivot here would be your ankle. This pivot here in the middle would be your knee, and this would be your hip. That's where he said he got the idea. Okay, when this goes over center, all the pressure comes back. The lock pushes up, up against the rail, so it can't, cannot, can't, cannot come open. When it fires, this whole assembly moves back, and you got a roller here. And as it moves back, and it's hard to do with a, the spring on it, this moves against this roller, and this cams this, cams this up like this. See, you see what I'm saying? It's a roller and it rolls against this. This is a cam that breaks the lock over center. And as this keeps moving back, it changes linear motion into rotate, rotating motion to function the lock. Now, is that a reciprocating handle? Yes, this, this moves every time it fires. Ugh. Could you imagine that big piece of steel moving every time you fired it? And so, again, what was the rate of fire on something? Uh, like about. 500, 550 rounds a minute. Five to 550. So, what would a standard AR-15 on the market is full auto or you know M16? Well, they're or? probably, I'm not sure, eight or nine hundred. They're so, not particularly yeah, like so fast. Yeah, so it wouldn't be a fast, super shooting. fast, but you're throwing a lot of lead down at one time. Yeah, and uh, they're amazing. The reliability on these things is probably better than. There's only one other gun they consider more reliable than these. And that would be the British Vickers, and the British Vickers is a modified Maxim. <laughs> Vickers. <laughs> History lesson, go back. We, we might about find, Vickers. We, we might find one of them. Okay, cool. So we talked about Vickers earlier, which is British. British. It was a, the British company of Vickers, they made uh, the ships for the British Navy, they made the cannons for the British, they were a steel company. They so, made the steel for the Titanic, actually. So you're you're <laughs> super reliable. Uh, so a little brittle there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you know. So I couldn't imagine. I, that would sound like one of those uh, government government in on families that owned everything at one time to me. Because if they did all the ships, you're telling me they get guns. They did all this crap. Somebody's loaded. <laughs> yeah, they were loaded. Uh, yeah, uh, well, Vickers for the British, what Krupp was to the Germans, if you've ever heard of Krupp. And I'm sure I will <laughs> on the next uh, no, installment. No, you won't, because uh, Krupp never made anything this small. It doesn't matter, we'll talk about it anyway. <laughs> but, um, guys, I'm going to give you a couple minutes here at the end, anybody that's watching live, um, why I talk to Jan, if you guys have any questions and you want to learn anything more about this while we're doing this live, please let us know. Um, Jan, I think these... The ones that we're bringing in and talking about, it's not something that a lot of people are going to ever see. And these so, are a museum piece. Exactly. I these, want, are, these are literally a museum And that's piece. why we do these, to be able to show people yeah. some things without having to go to a museum and listen to the little talk box. Well, in a museum, you never get to see the inside of one. That's or, true. That's true. And um, if you look on the top of these, this is a typical German gun. If you look on the top, uh, there's the serial number. There's the model number. There's the maker, where it was made, and there's the date. <laughs> so, uh, 
almost all. I don't want to say numbers matching, but there is a literally a number on every piece of this thing. There I mean, is. there's a number on every leg, every bull, every. I mean, literally, there's numbers all over this. Yeah, it's if you look, the serial insane. number here, it'll be here. All the parts have matched. This gun actually matches. Anything this gun was probably never used. Okay. It's too yeah. nice. That's the original finish. That is absolutely insane that they have made something in. And it's 101 no. year old. Well, now be 102 years old. Two years old. We're awesome, and we're in 2020 now. So, guys, thank you for watching again another installment of Let's Talk History. And this one is about the Maxim machine gun. And the next one is going to be a surprise, so you have to check in again somewhere between 4.30 and 5 o'clock every single Thursday right here with Jan and Alex. Leave the comments if there's a gun that you want us to talk about, something that we might be able to pick up from somebody, something that um, well, the shop might have in their collection, Jan might have in his, we don't know. So guys, and it doesn't it, have to be a machine gun either. It absolutely doesn't. If you want to talk about absolutely anything, you let us know and we will try to make that happen. Thanks again, guys. Jan, in closing, anything you want to say? No. Uh, oh, one other thing. Uh, th See, th this is right this, there, I knew he did. Th this is uh, rather cute. Uh, well, I shouldn't say cute. Uh, in the early 1900s, like I say, Maxim sold these guns to everybody. And uh, he was accused of being a merchant of death. <laughs> well, <laughs> he kind of was a merchant of death. <laughs> so. I mean, he didn't think too highly yeah. of that either. Yeah. So, I, I, man, I tell you, we, we've talked about Maxim a lot. And it seems like he, all the inventions he had, all of the... Is, is this the only gun that he came out with or does he have is he like the browning only, is the only machine gun is the only firearm max and ever made was these blows my mind uh, why went, wouldn't he have came up with other tools that he could make money on i don't know now the interesting thing is this is a little bit other thing everybody's heard of lugers the yeah, German yeah, yeah. Luger. well the story goes that george luger had the gun ready to go in 1899 but he didn't bring it out till 1900 because a German Luger works exactly the same way as the lock works on a Maxim machine gun. And if he would have brought it out before... He would have went into the patent on... He, he, Maxim would have sued him for patent violations. He he waited, it it sounds like he would have. Yeah. 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 And they had to wait till his patents expired on the on the toggle mechanism. So next time, <laughs> next time you're hanging out with your friends at the bar, and be like, hey, by the way, gun friends, a little bit of knowledge I'm going to drop on you. Did you know that the Luger was actually ready in 1899 because of the Maxim patent? Yeah, the Maxim. They didn't come out until next year because they didn't want to get sued for patent. Yeah. <laughs> Got that locked away, boys. Thank you so much for with another cool piece of history.